Greetings in the precious name of Jesus. It's very good to be here, and I thank you for the invitation. Um, it's been a blessing um, just feeling the unity and the oneness of spirit, and I believe it's a taste of heaven when we will all be together in unity. So I appreciate that, and um, yeah, it's a pleasure to worship with you this morning. And it's an honor and a privilege to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and to be His children. As I thought of the message this morning, the subject came to me and I was, it came to me in such a profound way, um, I knew it was what God wanted me to preach about, but as I thought of it, it's such a simple message that I was almost to the point of being just a little bit embarrassed that this is so simple, yet it's so simple that it's so easily missed um, as we live, our, live out our lives day to day. To day. I still had some doubts until I heard Mike share about his visit to the graveyard yesterday. And you know, we have one chance. We have one life to live. And we can either do it the best we can, or we can go about it limping around and just doing a shabby job of it. But we have one life to live. As I thought of this service, and us being here, it reminded me of other services that I've been at. And the subject, and I'll introduce it soon, that I have, it's very personal to me, it's very practical, but it's very personal, something that I've wrestled with. But there's been similar services like this, where I'd walk out of this building somewhat encouraged, excited. Thank you, brother. And I'd have a, just a bit of an excitement to serve the Lord. And this was referring back to more of my youth days. And I'd go out, and I'd seen some old friends, met some new friends, hung out with some good people, had a good Dutch meal, and left Sunday afternoon, thought maybe I could serve the Lord. And about 24 hours later, I either forgot about it or was very discouraged about it. I didn't know how. And it was something that was, serving the Lord was something that you do elsewhere. It's something you sign up to do and go do a term. Or it was something that the line of preachers did. And finally, through, throughout life, I wrestled with this and such. Serving the Lord is something that we're all called to do. And... We have, as we heard this morning, we have the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. We have that within us. And we're all called to serve the Lord with that power. So the title of my message this morning is simply the question. I want you to ask this question as you go throughout this day. It's a simple question. How do I serve God? How do I serve God? It's been, a, oh, just a couple months ago, maybe about three months I was challenged by a brother to pray the prayer. Instead of praying the prayer, Lord, thank you for this day. Keep me safe. Help me throughout the day. To pray the prayer, Lord, how can I best serve you today? That simple prayer, Lord, how can I best serve you today? And when I heard that, and I tried to pray that prayer, I'll admit I was scared to pray that. It took me, I think, a couple days to finally get that prayer out. Because it's risky. What's God going to ask me to do? What's, what's going to happen? So, I want to approach that, that subject, how do I serve God? And I'm going to just be going through some practical things, and I pray and hope it blesses and inspires your heart but not only that, causes you to think and consider where you're at in your life right now. First of all, how do I serve God? Obedience. Obedience is the first requirement to serve God. John 14, 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken to the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. 
because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. How do you serve God? How do you get started? Do the next right thing. Whatever God is asking you to do right now, right now, do that. Whatever God is asking you to do, whatever God is asking you to do, tomorrow at 1035, do that right now. Whatever God is asking you to do right now, that's the best way to serve God. God is not going to lead you into opportunities or further lead you into His will for your life until you obey what He is already asking of you. To reject the truth that God has already given to you and at the same time believe that He is going to lead you into a life of fulfillment is deception and disobedience. So, is God asking you to forgive someone? Is God asking you to make something right? You've hurt someone. Is God asking you to confess some sins? Is God asking you to return good for evil? Someone's done you evil, and He's asking you to be intentional and return good for evil. The best way you can serve the Lord is obey that voice. It's not a hard journey serving God. It's a life of joy. 1 John 5, 3 for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. God is not a hard taskmaster. Proverbs thirteen fifteen, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressors is hard. It's the disobedient, it's the man who chooses not to serve the Lord and rejects truth that has a hard path. Serving God is is a daily choice. It's not something you just sign up for a couple years. It's a daily choice. Like I said, what is the right thing to do right now? Choosing right in the, in the most simple times. Choosing right. It's the small decisions. It's the small decisions that we're faced with that actually make a big change in our life. Notice what I just said. It's the small decisions that we make that make a big change in our life. It gets very practical. It gets very down to earth. And I'd like to share a story with you. I have a few stories this morning. But for me, you know, God's still working on me, and hopefully He's working on you. Um, this thing of serving the Lord and it's daily choices. I live west of Millersburg, and this has been a this this journey started a few years back, but probably not as long as what I would like to admit. Um, anyhow, on my way to work, there's a certain place as you come into Millersburg that it just seemed like too often someone would pull out in front of me, and it was extremely aggravating to me. So aggravating that the first time it happened, it did not look pretty. And I would not want the video to play what happened. And God spoke to me. He was like, you know what, that, that's, that was not how a Christian should act. And, you know, God used that lane there. And I could call it Patience Alley. Because as people continue to pull out in front of me, God kept working on me. And my response, praise the Lord, got less and less aggressive. And praise the Lord, I, I completely thank the Lord. Um, I finally got to the place, I knew God was working on me. And I finally got to the place where I could kind of say something good about the jerk in front of me, the brother in front of me. But I finally got to the point where a guy pulled out in front of me, and I burst out, and I sang a song. And I'll be honest, I felt kind of pleased with myself that I finally got to that point. But you know what? The peace that came over me when I finally got to that point, when I finally ch chose God's way, the peace that came over my heart, I would not trade for anything. 
It's the small decisions, the small decisions that change you, your response. Our daily choices soon develop into our lifestyle and way of living. It becomes our character, our personality. It becomes the normal. I ask you, how does the normal look to you? What do you look like? You know, I've heard terms like, well, <laughs> that's him. Or, well, you know her. Well, who is him? And who is her? What have you become? What does your life look like? Does your personality and character serve God? Does your personality and character serve God? Does your countenance, when people see you, are they pointed to Jesus? Or are they pointed to just stay in the dumps? Again, it's daily small choices. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and think about our lifestyle and priorities. And before I get into this, I am not going to put anyone on a guilt trip. I've been put on many guilt trips when it talks about lifestyle and priorities. And I'm kind of sick of guilt trips. So this is to encourage you. Matthew 6.33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. Notice it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, we're called to build the kingdom of God. We're also called to serve God. I want to remind you, that's, that's what we're talking about. Ask you the question, ask yourself the question, what does God get from my life? And I've, I've thought of that. I've asked myself that question. What is God getting from me? You know, I blast through the week and finally Saturday night gets around and, well, it's time to serve God. What, what, or at the end of a day, you know, it's 11 o'clock, you're exhausted. What did God get from my life today? Does he get the leftovers or the last couple minutes of the day before you go to sleep? Or are you planning to give God the retired years of your life after you've raised your families and lived your life. Serving God's a choice, and it takes an intentional effort. There are some faulty belief systems, I believe, that are out there, and I like to name three of them. And these are three terms that I have heard in my growing up years and as I wrestled things out. And, I, and they mean well. And before I say the terms, I'm going to say what I believe the faulty belief system is. First of all, it says daily life is separate from serving God. What I'm, just, what I'm, what I'm getting ready to say, I'm suggesting that these, this is the faulty belief system that it's portraying. That daily life is separate from serving God. That work and business are separate from serving God, and raising a family is separate from serving God. Serving God's over here when we have time, but you know what? We, we, we got to get our kids raised. Um, okay, here's, here's the things I've heard, and again, I just want you to consider this. Number one, I would like to get my business to the place where I can get away and do some mission work. I've heard that. It's, it's not, not a bad thing to say. But the sobering thing is, God doesn't work with your timing, and he doesn't work with my timing, nor what we deem convenient. When we're ready to do the mission work, the blessing and plan that God had for us may be long gone. If you, also, if you have a business, turn your business into a mission field. And I have been extremely inspired. I've rubbed shoulders with men and businesses who have done that. And it gets me really, really excited. They are changing the lives of their employees. Or they're actively involved in changing the lives of their employees. They're investing in their employees. I love it. It's a team. Number two. I would like to get my business to the place where I can get away and spend more time with my family. Folks, the sobering and sad reality, 
and I've seen this, the sobering and sad reality is years later, Dad is saying, you know, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. And the grown children are saying, Dad just never had time for me. Dads, do it now. Do it now. Number three, a goal I have is that when I am older and retired, I would like to maybe do some voluntary service somewhere and do some mission work. Again, that's a good idea. It's a good idea. And if you have that in mind, I bless you for that. I think it's a good idea. But young marrieds can also do mission work. Youth can do mission work. Families that are in the middle of changing diapers can do mission work. If God calls you at the age of 22, or 29, or 36, whatever age, to really make a big change to your life, the best and safest thing to do is to obey that call. Service to God is for all of us at any age of life. Youth, Ecclesiastes 12.1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. God is calling you as a youth, you as a young person, to serve him. Young families, you with just a handful of kids, and I've been there, and I loved it. You can serve the Lord now. I was convicted. Um... We had five children, I think under the age of six, and two came at once. Um, anyhow, I went to the Haiti auction, and I was feeling a bit disgruntled, and um, we had all these children, and a bunch of children at the Haiti, at the Haiti benefit auction isn't exactly the best mix um, sometimes. You soon lose them, and our one boy even ended up up front, and they said, does anyone know who this boy is? So fortunately, I think my wife went and rescued him. But. <laughs> but I was there at the Haiti auction, and I was, someone said something to me that changed my life ever since then. I was kind of, I made some sort of grumpy comment about how it's just hard raising a family and being in survival mode. And he kindly told me this. He said, I, I never forgot it. He said, our families are not just a survival plan but we're called to serve the Lord with our families. And that got my attention. He was an easygoing guy that told me. Boy, he got my attention. And it changed my perspective. I was almost kind of pitying myself that, you know, th this, is, this is going to be a chore. But it he used that to change my perspective on what I'm to do with my family. And I want to tell you, young parents, your families, your children, especially in this day and age, is a huge testimony for Jesus Christ. People need to see families. They need to see mom and dad with a row of children. They need to see that. Something else, a story I want to share, just to encourage you young families, that you can, you can do something. Your, your families are not a burden. My wife and I spent uh, just over five years in Florida working for Choice Books, and I loved it. And... Anyhow, I started to get the burden for all the Spanish people and such um, in the surrounding area. And before I go further, we as Christians here in America have a huge opportunity with all the people that are coming across the border. There's, there's a ripe mission field. Have, a, have the right attitude about it. When you think about those people coming over, think in the kingdom of God. Anyhow, I had a bunch of gospel literature that I had collected from over the years. And also, I kept spying the pile of gospel literature and CDs and DVDs and such in the church library. And I finally got sick of seeing it just sit there and mold. I decided, you know what, we're going to go out and get rid of all of it. So without any, I mean, I confess, without even asking the preacher, I went and confiscated all the gospel literature from the church. That was kind of my character. Um... And I went and headed toward Arcadia. I took my family. I said, we're going to do something as a family. 
and took a whole big pile of stuff out to Arcadia. It was a Friday afternoon, and we got, we had three, three little boys at the time, and we got out there at an extremely crucial time. The Spanish folks were coming out of the huge strawberry fields, and they were in a really good mood because they just got their paycheck. But the buses were coming in, and guys were unloading, and they were getting their paychecks. Anyhow, here we were, me and my wife, and you know this neat, cute little beachy couple with these three little um, boys. But those people connected extremely well with us as a young family. Those men seen us, and a smile just broke across their face. I think they were probably remembering their families from back home. And you know what? It didn't take long at all. We were completely depleted of DVDs, CDs, what it church. I mean, we passed out in a hurry. My boys were passing out stuff, and who's going to say no to a little boy? And we, were, we went home empty. I don't, I don't know if the church restocked yet, but I'm still thankful it's, it's emptied out. But I really believe that as young families, you have a door into situations like that. Because people, especially those type of people, when they see a young family like that, their heart opens up. Keep that in mind. Switching the gears a little bit. Relationships. Is your relationships serving God? John 13, 35, and this, is, this has been something I've worked with. John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples... Now, wait, wait. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Our relationships are supposed to point Jesus, point people to Jesus. Are we spreading the love of Jesus through our relationships? What does the world see in your relationships? What does God see? In your marriage. In your relationship with your wife or your husband, your relationship with your parents, are you serving the Lord the best you can with and in your relationships, your siblings, with your children? How does that look? And last, the relationship with your church. And it grieves me, you know, I see on the news or whatever, all the churches that are emptying out. Can it be said of you, though, that you love your church? A good way to show that you love your church is to show up. Show up! Show up ten minutes early. If, if you're struggling supporting your church, and if you even have, maybe have a bit of a bad attitude, show, make an intentional effort to show up ten minutes early and pray. It's a good thing to try. And I say this next, you know, sometimes people make the decision to sleep in and show up after Sunday school. And the best way I can describe that, and this is kind of practical from someone who likes hamburgers, but it's actually eating a hamburger without the meat. You don't get the full meal deal. <laughs> show up and show up 10 minutes early and be there for Sunday school. Make the teacher happy. He probably stayed up till midnight studying. Show up and support him. Be a willing worker. You know, I got this, and we, you probably got this call as too. I got this call from a stressed out superintendent here. It's been a couple years back. And he was asking me to have devotions, you know, the science school devotions. And I could tell, I could just hear the stress in his voice. And he finally admitted that I was the eighth person, the eighth person that he tried um, for that week. And if you're feeling guilty, good. Because... <laughs> and so I put him out of his misery, and I told him, yeah, I'll have devotions. And I was, the eighth, I was the eighth person. Which maybe they are all, I don't know, had a broken leg or something. But... Um, I was really inspired. A friend of mine from out of state said he was so blessed. There was a gentleman that went to his church, and I have never heard this before. He said every time, 
Every time you would ask this man to have devotions, no matter what you asked him, he would have this response. I'd love to. Can you have devotions? I'd love to. Can you teach social class? I'd love to. What if you were a church full of I'd love to's? You know... Amen. Yep. Hallelujah. Judson would probably start growing hair again. I don't know. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. I hope that's okay, Judson. I'd love to. It's, it will change your life. It will change the life of your Sunday school superintendent, too. It will probably lengthen it. Be an I'd love to church member. Be that. And going into the last part of my message, we're called to be faithfulness. I'd like to talk about faithfulness. If you care to, turn to Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. God's going to bring our life into account. The way, what you did and what you didn't do is going to be brought into account. God is asking you to be faithful. No matter what your background is, no matter what you struggle with, or no, no matter what excuses you have. And I'll say too, God doesn't do the best with excuses. He, actually, He doesn't appreciate them. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power He gives you to serve. Sometimes I think God get, is up there and he's just kind of saying, get with it, in a loving way. Anyhow, Matthew twenty-five fourteen, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done. Good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he that hath abundance and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers, brothers and sisters, how do I serve God? It's with a willing heart. It's with a willing heart. It's sobering. And it needs to get our attention. It's the man with one talent that missed it. The man with one talent missed it. Little things count. Little things count, but they get easily missed. Little things are just as important to God as big things. All will be brought to account. It's not the size or quantity that matters. It's our faithfulness. What we do with it what we do with that little thing. 
Serve God where he has called you. I firmly believe that serving locally is just as important as serving overseas. There is just as much, there is just as big of a mission field here in Holmes County as there is in anywhere else in the world. It's because it's not where you are, it's where God has called you. And wherever God calls you, it's big. It's significant. He has a work for all of us. As a Christian, the daily routine of life is mission work. Your life is mission work. Your business is mission work. Your family is mission work. Serve God with what he has placed in your hands. Mothers, rocking chairs make some amazing pulpits. And you're the preacher. It makes some amazing pulpits. You have a tremendous influence on your children. Pick up the talent that God has given to you and multiply it. Also notice the servant did not decide what was given to him and placed in his responsibility. He didn't say, hey God, um, I'll take that one over there. I'll, I'll do that. I'll go here. I'll go there. No. He was brought into account with what God put in his hands. What is in your hands? Use it to serve the Lord. Again, it's not the size or quantity that matters. It's our faithfulness. And then, sliding into the end here, most very important is, as you serve the Lord, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ. When David was faced with a giant, there was the giant, the big guy, the big problem. This is his words. Don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. He also said, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. David knew his God. And when you know your God, the giants shrink. You can conquer the giants when you know your God. Matthew, okay, take that story, take David's words, and compare them with a story in the New Testament. Matthew 14, verses 15 and 16, finds Jesus in a remote area. And I think Jesus was tired, and he was sad, because not too long ago, he had just found out his cousin, John the Baptist, was killed. And Jesus wanted to get away a little bit and spend some time alone. And 5,000 people found out where he was at. Anyhow, evening came along, and that evening the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, and I, I remember when I seen what Jesus said. Before Jesus did the miracle, the disciples came up and they said, what do we do with all these people? And Jesus turned and he told them, that isn't necessary. You feed them. In Matthew it says, the, the disciples' response was this. But, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. And Mark, their response is this. With what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. In Luke, it says, but. Now, Jesus had turned to the disciples. People who he commissioned to go out and do. He sent them out, had sent them out two by two. This is their response in Luke. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? So Jesus performed the miracle himself. Folks, you might be courageous enough to go out these doors and lift your hands to God and say, tomorrow morning you might say, Lord, how can I best serve you today? And you know, 
as you look at Jesus, he might look at you and point to 5,000 people and say, go feed them. Or he might point to some really discouraged person and say, go encourage him. He might point to some really impossible task and say, go conquer that giant. If God does that, obey with a willing heart. Serve faithfully, but you're going to have to keep your eyes on Jesus. Because if you look to circumstances, and if you look to the so-called supply chain, you're going to run out. Because there's not enough food to feed 5,000 people. It's going to take Jesus Christ and your faith in Jesus Christ to do the impossible tasks. How do I serve God? Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Thank you for your attention. Let's bow our heads forward to prayer. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. You're a good God. And Father, Jesus, how can we best serve you today? I pray, Father, that you would enter into our hearts, Lord, and call us and show us what you'd have us to do. Help us, Lord, to make a difference in Holmes County. Help us, Lord, to make a difference right on our church benches, Lord, in the lives of our brothers and sisters, with our neighbors, and in our communities. Lord, give us a passion and desire and wisdom and direction on how to put our families to work in doing mission work and serving you. Our businesses, our life, our driving, our attitudes, our relationships. Everything we have, Lord, may it serve you. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever. Amen.